Namaste. It was a cold winter evening in 1948. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was walking across a lawn to attend his daily evening multi-faith prayer meeting. Suddenly, one man stepped out of the friendly crowd, first bowed to Gandhi in reverence and then shot him at point-blank range. But Gandhi had lost the will to live several months before that assassin caught up with him. On his last birthday, which was his only birthday in free India, in October 1947, Gandhi said he wanted no one to celebrate. He considered his birthday a day of mourning because he had lived to see his work reduced to ashes. For 50 years before that, Gandhi worked for two things, non-violent political action and a free and united India. But freedom came with partition and horrific communal violence in which two million people were killed and many, many more were displaced. My clan lived through and survived that Holocaust. I have vivid childhood memories of my parents and other elders speaking about Gandhi's, the trauma, both of Gandhi's assassination and of partition. They say a million and a half people showed up for Gandhi's funeral procession. My father was in that crowd, bowing in sorrow and in homage. And it's from my father that I first learned of Gandhi's unwavering commitment to nonviolence. Ahimsa, we call it in Sanskrit. Gandhi believed that he had failed his experiment to take Indian society towards nonviolence through the freedom struggle. He believed he had failed, but not the principle. So, what gave Gandhi this unfavoring faith? Why did he believe that nonviolence is as old as the hills? And what can we today learn from that story? And what it tells us about the connections between our outward actions to make the world a better place and our inward journey, our quest for our own peace with ourselves and therefore well-being. So, I'll begin the story actually with a uh, quote from Margaret Mead, the cultural anthropologist. She was asked, what would be the first artifact of civilization? And she didn't point to any human-made object. She pointed to a 15,000-year-old skeleton, which showed that the femur had broken and then healed, and the person had gone on to live a longer life. This meant that someone or several people fed and protected that person long enough for that bone to heal while the person was immobile. Gandhi knew this by instinct, that civilization began not with settled agriculture or fire or the wheel. It began when we stopped for those who fell. We are talking about a time when our ancestors were herds like most of the animal kingdom, he was just moving around. This is why Gandhi was crystal clear that to equate sophistication of technology with civilization is the path to darkness. Because civilization is that which en encourages us, which enables us to cultivate care, compassion, cooperation and mutuality. Now, how did these insights manifest in Gandhi's life? Because he may have known this at an intellectual level, but what is more fascinating about Gandhi's life is how these feelings, these ideas manifested in what he actually did and what happened to him. So, there I have one more story of Gandhi. He's 24 years old. He is as yet an unsuccessful lawyer. He is actually struggling to make a living. And he's on a train journey in South Africa when he is actually late at night at a pretty much in a, on a station in the middle of nowhere. 
He is evicted from the train by a white passenger because he says it is not legal for a brown man to travel first class. Now, you could think that this was a perfect situation to have a lifelong trauma. It could have made him resentful. Gandhi could have ended up hating white people for the rest of his life, maybe even having violent feelings towards them. But exactly the opposite happened. One, Gandhi realized this is not about him. It's not personal. Two, he realized that the real issue here is the injustice and the discrimination. And three, that he can work to change this. But that he must change this without even a trace of either resentment or hatred or even condemnation of the offender. Now, condemnation doesn't mean that he would in any way be making excuses for the offence, but he's separating the sin from the sinner. This basic insight is what, in different ways, I have found in the 108 episodes of Ahimsa Conversations that I've done over two and a half years with people from 24 countries, that I find there is a diversity of definitions of what is nonviolence. But some things are basic and they, I'm finding that they are universal. One, that Ahimsa is not absence of violence. Two, that Ahimsa is that energy which is released, which flowers when we give up our desire to harm or to hit back at someone. Three, that Ahimsa is meaningful, of course, and always in, in, in our small individual and collective actions in the family and friends. But above all, it is powerful when it is an instrument of fighting injustice. And at a higher level, many of the people who work in this sphere believe that Ahimsa is love in action. Everybody is not able to practice that. That is true. And I will give you now the challenge. What is the challenge in this? Because these things are all very nice and very comforting. But there is a challenge. And the challenge is that we have to deal with the reality of violence. Physical violence, emotional violence. And there... I actually got help from a, a woman I met at a nonviolence training workshop in New York. And she stood up and said, I ain't gone to a gunfight with a bat in my hand. And immediately I heard an echo of what Gandhi always said, that it is better to take to arms and fight even physically rather than be cowardly or cower in fear. So, this is an interesting and fascinating thing to me that many people who are drawn to nonviolence training are looking for a way where they can be brave, actively brave, that is, they don't want to be cowards, and yet they don't want to go into the fight with physical violence. They do want to stand up to injustice, but without physical violence. In the last 70 years, this basic insight has been developed in theory and in practice across the world. From Egypt to Serbia, from Tunisia to Latin America, movements have adopted nonviolent protests to overthrow repressive regimes. And yet, how do we benefit from this today? What does this tell us that can help us in our actual quest, both for more rigorous and effective action in the world and also to keep our well-being growing rather than, you know, having an internal uh, situation where we are depleting ourselves. It's a very big question. I'm not going to attempt to answer all of it. But I have one suggestion. What if we were to at every stage, ask ourselves, what is the dharma of my karma? In translation, that means, what is the civilizational frame which anchors my actions? If, for example, you are convinced that life is short, nasty and brutish in its raw form, 
and that violence is the dominant impulse of our species, then we are constantly seeing ourselves swimming against the tide. Then there is a risk that the list of problems is endless and it will remain endless and success will always be an ever receding goal. But if we recognize and there is now evidence to show us this, there is multidisciplinary evidence to show and this is from the natural and social sciences to show that non-violence is actually an equally powerful impulse. I mean, the jury will be out a long time on, on, on which impulse is stronger, violence or non-violence, but they are definitely equal. And there is research which shows that it is much harder, and armies across the world have found this, militaries, it's much harder to break down people's inhibition. In other words, it's much harder to train people to kill and quite easy for people to learn the principles and the techniques of nonviolent action. So, if we believe that violence is more fundamental to our species, then I'm afraid we are risking individual depression and collective despair. But if we are willing to look through the lens of nonviolence, then we are gazing upon a wide open horizon in which the possibilities, the creative potential is infinite. I'll close with another story of a journey about someone you all must have heard about. Rosa Parks, when she defied that racism on the bus in Montgomery, it was not a fluke. It was a consequence of, yes, faith in a principle, but training which enabled her to do that. And what was the core truth that Rosa Parks was embodying. She was embodying the truth that conflict may be inevitable. That is the reality of the human condition, but violence is not. It is Hannah Arendt with her political philosopher's rigor who helped us all to see that it is never power that flows from the barrel of a gun. It's only instant obedience. Because power, if it is meaningful, is always collective. True power is always power with, not power over. And this, I will now go back to where we started. This to me is the significance and the importance of retelling the story of Gandhi's assassination. That murder is a moment in time. It's not going to define who we are or what we think we can be as a species. But the defiant disobedience that Gandhi embodied, disobedience to the logic of violence, disobedience to hatred, that is an inspiration for all times. Namaste. <laughs>